Hello, welcome to Talent Acquisition Trends and Strategy. I am your host, James Mackey. We have a really fun panel today. This is the second segment. Um, we have Bridget Tesler joining us, which is the VP of Recruitment Solutions here at Secure Vision, uh, Julia Arpeg, who is our talent team lead, and Andrea Florescu, who is the VP of Operations at Secure Vision. So uh, between the, the the four of us, we've worked with uh, hundreds of uh, you know VC-backed SaaS companies, helping them uh, do everything from, from hire to build talent strategy. So uh, this is going to be a fun conversation. And uh, the first thing that we we wanted to, to dive into is compensation for 2023. Uh, when I was at the CEO summit in, in Miami, which was like 80, 90 tech CEOs, and I, I had a chance to, to speak in front of them. One of the, the biggest questions that they had was like, how is uh, compensation being impacted by, uh, you know, the current market? And are we see like, are we seeing like uh, salaries go down, right, as a result of, of what's happening? So I, I, I think that this could be a really interesting topic. Bridget, I would love if you could uh, start us off here on, on what you're seeing happen in the market as, as it pertains to, to salary. Maybe we could touch on like leadership as well as individual contributor. If there's any variance there, that would be, even if there's not, that'd be good to know, right? Absolutely. So, you know, when I was doing some research and prepping for this call today, um, you know, they're saying that the average salaries are going to increase for 2023, 4.2 to 4.6%. That's what people are forecasting. They're going to be increasing in general across the board. Um, but you know, when talking with hiring managers, talking with CEOs, talking with leadership, and then conversely talking with candidates, there's still a disparity as to what they're expecting to see in the market for 2023. CEOs and hiring managers are still hopeful and expecting that they're going to be able to get labor on the cheap due to the fact that we've had this plethora of news of layoffs and right-sizing of organizations. And I think that, you know, talent still expects to, to be fairly compensated and equally compensated for their experience level and what the market's been doing and what the economy has done from an inflation rate. And so the discounts that they're, that hiring managers and CEOs are expecting to get don't exist. We're not seeing the meteoric rise that we have over the past 18 months of compensation because the big tech companies were just throwing out money and bonuses and everything to hire talent because there was a war on talent. That's not happening anymore. But we're not getting discounts on labor and, and great people because, again, they have a lifestyle that they are afforded. They have inflation that they are attempting to accommodate for, interest rates going up. Housing prices have continued to rise. Maybe we'll see some of that stuff come back down, but there's no discount to be had. Yeah. So they think they can get away with paying lower salaries in this full context. You're exactly right, Bridget. I've kind of seen this research online as well and people saying, and a lot of experts are even saying that this is really a component of employers in tech in particular trying to take back control, especially mm -hmm. after these two years when everything has gone much better on the employee side, I would say, which I support. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's it's a part of taking back control, many experts are saying, which does make sense in a way. And another interesting nugget of information that I think relates very well here. Um, so there's been the law that came into effect in New York and California, other states as well recently, that employers have to add their uh, compensation ranges on job descriptions and make them public. Mm -hmm. um, now, what companies are trying to do, again, to mitigate costs, uh, a lot of them are actually putting down huge ranges on mm -hmm. their JDs. Like yeah. you can see a JD with a range of 50,000 to 150,000 per year. That's insane. That's right. So And they're doing that too because they want to conserve negotiating power, which again is understandable, but still there needs to be a balance there, I, I believe, in my opinion. And you're right, Bridget, we cannot go back on salaries of people. I mean, that's you can't take money away from people's pockets. Mm -hmm. What I love is the people that I, I've seen the post on LinkedIn where people are like, hey, so my company just posted my exact job yes. <laughs> for 50 to 100K more than I make. So I applied for it. Like they're like, may I please have that? Like, can I please? Right? That, that is another reason. Yes. Why they're writing such huge compensation ranges yes. so they can protect themselves from that, too. You're right. 
But I'm saying the comp range for that started at 50K above her current. So that's why she was like, "Mm -mm, no, thank you. (laughs) But what I love is the, the, like, kind of like just thinking, like taking a step back and thinking about comp strategy, not only for new roles that you're hiring, but like, like that with that girl situation, like her existing comp plan is not in line with the current market. So that would be, I think, an amazing thing. And again, I get, I get that we're in this like tightening our belts kind of place. But I think if you're able to pay 50K higher, then you're currently paying your current team. If, if they're performing, if they're producing, I think that definitely makes sense to factor into your budget for 2023. Instead of saying, let's just dump all of our personnel money into the new people we bring on. Like who are your top performers? Who's doing a good job? Who do you want to stick around? Who do you want to make sure knows they're doing a good job? Let's see if we can distribute that more evenly instead of starting yeah. our comp range at 50K above what our current team is making. And do you think bring- companies are really doing that? Like that seems really like if some people are at like, let's say uh, a certain base salary and they're posting the same job for more. I mean, I'm not saying that like some companies don't make that type of dopey mistake, but that just seems really dumb. Like I can't see a lot of companies doing that quite honestly. I'm sure like, it I- was an anomaly. I, yeah. And I'm sure that company quickly took down the post. Yeah, it can't be like a normal problem. I mean, like. Yeah, but again, that factors into why companies are adding such huge compensation ranges on their JD because they want to protect themselves against that. And Julia's point, I agree, like you should bring everyone to the level in time, whenever you can, in a timely manner, like as fast as you can, considering inflation as well. Like, yes, top performers, but everyone needs to beat inflation which is beating all of us right now. Yeah, I I think the big thing with all of the pay transparency laws, which I think is amazing, Mm -hmm. um, it it allows people to take a look at what the internal equities are like, like you're pointing out, Julia, that it's really important that we understand, um, you know, time and role, the value that somebody brings to an organization. That's why we have salary and pay bands is because people come from different backgrounds and experience levels. So that's why in an account manager role, you may have you know, a $50,000 spread from the top to the bottom because based upon experience and what somebody's bringing to the table, they could fit anywhere within that salary band. But having a $150,000 pay band is ridiculous. Exactly. Like it should be 40% max, in my opinion, like the difference, 40, 50%, I don't know, maximum, not a hundred, not more. One question that specifically came up speaking with a lot of CEOs was surrounding just like our salary is going to be decreasing um, and, and, or uh, maintaining or going up. I think one thing that's really important is that like to remember that before this correction, salary skyrocketed uh, well above a median, well above what was a sustainable level, just like growth uh, was at an unsustainable level for companies, valuations were at an unsustainable level. Um, you know, everything was was skyrocketing at the same time. And it was not a reflection of what is, what was, what would be an accurate value. Um, and, and again, that comes from an equity standpoint for like business ownership, as well as for uh, cascading all the way down to, to individual employees. So what's happening now with inflation and the slowing of the economy is things are right sizing. So valuations of companies are coming down, uh, salaries are coming down from the perspective of increased inflation is chipping away at a lot of the gains that we saw at salary folks are still up. It's still been great to be in tech. We're still at historical highs, just like what we're talking about with Silicon Valley Bank. Like people are still making more money uh, than they were uh, more than a couple of years ago. However, like it's just, it's right-sizing. It's returning to a healthy medium that's actually sustainable. So by salaries staying around the same, the economy is actually healing and getting to a healthier place than you know, last year where we were seeing like insane increases, like the reality is that, you know, folks that are used to like 50 to hundred K jumps, like within a year, like that's just not going to happen again. Uh, and again, there's anomalies. Like when you're looking at like, you know, top folks that, um, you know, maybe like 95th percentile, 90th percentile, like there's always that opportunity to make a lot more, um, you know, and over you know a couple of years, a year or two, but I think, you know, for, for a lot of folks that it, <laughs> Just like we're kind of riding this wave of of insane growth, uh, you know, it's 
sorry, it's not sustainable for any of us. It's not sustainable for uh, you know, business owners. It's not sustainable for individual contributors. And it's it's right sizing. And, and fortunately, we're, we're we're lucky enough to be in tech, so we're still making more money uh, than we were like a couple of years ago, despite inflation gains. But it's just not going to be what we saw in 2021. So. Uh, to some extent, like things are right sizing. I think the the other aspect to remember is like you want to be competitive in comp, mm. but it's like you never want to try to be like the one who's outbidding everyone. Um, maybe for like if you have strategic leaders uh, or something like that, you you do your best to do that. But uh, otherwise, like I I think like it's a good rule of thumb, like try to be around 80th percentile. If all you have to offer is straight cash compensation then there's always going to be someone willing to outbid you. Like Apple could decide to go through a big hiring surge and pay people three, 400 K. And like, what the fuck are you going to do about that? So like you have to run your business in a sustainable way. And you it also like, if you go like percent, like above the 80th percentile, one vulnerability you have is that when there is a correction, you have to cut into like your, your best folks. Right. So it's, you know, we, we had a, competitor like not gonna obviously name names it's a company i respect very much um, but they offered sa uh, recruiter salaries to people that weren't very experienced like 180k and you know when the market turned they had to cut like almost everyone immediately and so you know companies that paid competitively but weren't necessarily like the number one you know those folks those employees were able to maintain their jobs for longer um and and have more stability so it's like you know that that's another thing to from an employer side it's not as sustainable you're going to be you're going to have to cut even deeper uh when there's a correction and from an employee side there's a vulnerability with working sometimes with the very top of the compensation range because you're more likely to be cut because you're a higher overhead expense mm -hmm. uh and and even if you're billable if there's a market correction and they're like well there's a lot of xyz talent on the marketplace this person's making you know 180 this person's making 60 then yeah. you know let's 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 do away with that and and right size our our PL uh, and get our margins back so it's these are just like all things to kind of think about when it comes to compensation strategy uh so yeah i mean i think like tech there's still a talent gap right there's a skill shortage and we're going to continue to see like salaries increase and good people are always going to make more money as they continue to advance in their career um but i think again the economy is going to kind of right size itself like we don't have to artificially think about what should we do with salaries just go with the market the market's going to tell us where we need to be and probably the lesson to be more intentional about hiring. Maybe that's a valuable lesson that we can extract from all of these years. Okay, growth, it's great. <laughs> Everyone wants it. But when you're growing, if you are growing your team, maybe scale it with more intentionality behind it for it to be like a sustainable growth. So when you do hit these periods, which we know are cyclical in our economy, you won't need to cut as much, right? And I think a great example, by the way, I was reading the other day is Apple. So if you look at Apple's growth compared to Meta, compared to uh, Twitter, SpaceX, any other of these companies, Facebook, uh, they had a more sustainable growth throughout 2020, 2021. They haven't grown with insane numbers. And thus, they weren't in the position to have to cut a lot of people. I think actually they didn't make any cuts or very few. So I think in a way, it's a good example of how we should be looking at growth, at hiring, being more intentional so that we avoid in the long run situations like this or at least at least mitigate them if we so can. And just for everybody tuning in, uh, following up on your point, Andrea, mm -hmm. Apple, so this is from Forbes, and this was posted about a month ago. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's possible something could have happened in the past month, but Apple avoided large layoffs, but is cutting contractors. Apple is one of the few tech companies that has avoided significant layoffs. Exactly. Nearly 110,000 tech workers downsized in 2023. Apple employees have been spared the X. Yeah. Exactly. So yes, they have cut contractors and some other stuff. Probably they cut their advertising budget, other budgets, but they were able to save jobs. So I think that's a good example. Well, and that's a, that's a good indicator too, that they have a good hiring process. They've hired the right people that are really adding value to the organization. There's not a whole lot of fluff. Like everyone is in a productive exactly. role that's actually helping operate mm -hmm. the business in a profitable way. Mm -hmm. um, 
yeah another reason to invest in apple right like not that i know right. like i don't <laughs> not suggesting that but like that seems like you know when you look at how they run is what about amazon by the way which i think you know not a down lot. The pipe so many layoffs. yeah yeah they were yeah. among the Facebooks and Twitters of the world. Yeah, yeah. huge, huge layoffs at Amazon. Yeah. Well, right. I think another thing we should consider outside of just cash compensation is how are we impacting and, and improving employee benefits and employee experience along the way? I think that there's a lot of value when you look at things holistically. Cash is very important, and we all need our paychecks to be able to live and thrive in, in this world. But also, you know, do you have... Uh, a strong PTO policy? Do you have strong medical dental vision benefits? Mm -hmm. What experience are you creating for your team that allows them to be able to step out of work right. and yeah. enjoy the fruits of their labor? Well, yeah. So yeah. that's, that's like another thing. It's like, it's more realistic when you try to build a holistic, like more realistic when you try to build a holistic mm -hmm. employment package. Uh, yep. It's more attainable because there's always going to be that company, even if it's like a startup where short term, they're paying people an insane amount of money because they got like a 50 million series B, which probably isn't going to happen this year. But you know what I mean? Like there's always going to be, even if it's not like an Apple or big tech, there's always going to be that company that has this sudden influx of cash. Mm -hmm. And so there's always somebody you just have to have the mindset that's going to be able to outbid you, even mm -hmm. if it's just on a temporary basis. Mm -hmm. But, you know, people will see like, oh shit, I can go make X amount of money here. Like, and then they're like laid off eight months later, but you know, they still like get the blinders on when they see that number. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's just one of those things like you should have, you should be investing. I, you know, one of the, the things that we did get right, and, you know, uh, I'll be the first to say that, you know, we've gotten a lot right at Secure Vision. Obviously, we made mistakes, not made mistakes. What, one of the things that I think we, we did a really good job was building the unit economics of the company to where we can be profitable and scale without like killing people with like, a, you know, 60, 70 hour work weeks, right? Like, mm -hmm. which particularly in recruiting is not uncommon, right? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. I, I think like, that is a huge part, a huge value add that, uh, you know, people, people value, uh, you know, a lot. So it's, it's a holistic approach. Comp is still important. You should still be paying better than the, the, the median in the marketplace. And you need to find a way to have the economics in your business to be able to do that, or at least the funding uh, with a path forward of knowing when you'll have the economics to do that uh, mm -hmm. at scale, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really interesting. It really is. I, mm -hmm. I, uh, I, but I do think like, people need to understand like they're not going to get top talent at a discount and also like the cost of talent acquisition running talent acquisition departments unfortunately is not going to go down too much like there's a headcount aspect where you know you're going to be able to lower overhead from that perspective uh but beyond that like in like a ratio between the cost per hire is not going to go down is is more so what I'm referring to because while there might be more talent readily available in the market, you're going to have to screen through a lot more applicants. There's going to be a lot more top of funnel focus. You're going to have to filter and try to find out who the best players are. Mm -hmm. You know, in the past, you might've had to interview a few folks to, to hire a great person. Now you're going to have to interview twice as many is, is what a lot of companies are seeing right now. There's just, it, it, there's just a lot more work to do on that front. And I think too, the other reason like White Cross Sahara will at least remain, remain consistent, if not go up is that, a lot of companies have not done a good job implementing process in tech. And so, you know, there is this, like, to the extent that there was a recruiting engine, it existed in recruiters' heads, and now they've cut the recruiters and there's this massive knowledge gap and there's no consistency in process or tech. Like, that's why, you know, a core part of your job, Andrea, is like a VP of operations, like I'm sure you would say is like, you're constantly building process playbooks and optimizing and figuring out how to bake into tech, whether it's greenhouse or Salesforce and the revenue ops stuff that you're doing. Like, yeah. Because like it it creates that baseline of stability as people move in and out of the organization, it allows us to continue to advance, right? Versus yeah. starting from scratch every time somebody leaves. And so um, I think that a lot of town acquisition departments just don't, you know, like like the one, the, 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 like the sticker, like the Instagram post would just be like, you know, hiring may be cyclical, investing in process and tech isn't. Like you always invest in that underlying uh, structure um, to, to make sure that you can, when you need to grow again, you can, you can quickly insert like the right resource, the right person 
and and get results so not only that i would say but process and process baked in tech helps everyone helps recruiters that are currently doing the job helps your team it helps them not waste time with manual activities for example or with stuff that can be done in a tool so it helps everyone all around and i think it also helps honestly to the broader picture that we were talking about earlier of being more intentional with everything that you're doing if you have process that's baked in tech, if you know how things are going, you can have a better idea of who you need to hire, why, be more intentional. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Andrea, I am obsessed with your process docs. Like they, <laughs> from when I started, like I started here almost two years ago and it was literally <laughs> like, I spent my first couple of days just reading and it was so, and w- which was amazing because I feel like onboarding, of course, needs to be like face to face to some extent, yeah. but I loved the combination. Like, I love that whatever your learning style, like having those process docs means you get to read and you get to listen and you get to talk and you get to shadow, like you get to do the whole thing. So kind of along this whole benchmarking, like comp plan thing, mm-hmm. I know James, you've talked a lot in your LinkedIn posts about you need to expedite onboarding as much as possible because the reality of like, we're talking about comp just constantly shifting is that you probably do have some employees who always kind of have their radar out for like, where could I get more money? What company would give me this perk or that perk? And unfortunately retention has dramatically decreased. Obviously as a company, like you said, Bridget, Secure Visions does an an amazing job of building out total rewards. Like our PTO program, our benefits, our culture in general. Like there are so many phenomenal things that you can do to try to retain, but there's also having to have the eye for the reality is we may have some turnover. So how can we make sure that we're setting our our team up for success from day one so that they're adequately paid, have an awesome total rewards program and can ramp quickly into their role and add value really quickly. So I love that. I think that's like the key combination for success. Did a LinkedIn post on this. So just in terms of like, uh, onboarding retention and then the concepts of like tenure and um you know it's it's the, the first point is like of course people should do everything that they can to retain their best people and then the other aspect of that is like invest heavily in onboarding and training and process docs because you know we're, we've a common thread of this episode has been like fighting a current yeah. and and yes you you want to be better than the median and in the industry and and when it comes to fighting a current and being successful but the reality is that like we are seeing increased rates of attrition overall in tech. And this isn't, I don't even know if I can consider it increase. I mean, this shit's been going on for like 15 years at this point, right? Like okay. people just move a lot in tech. And <clears throat> so like we kind of like are using, I was using the term as like attrition strategy. And I don't know if like that's, it's, I don't, I'm not saying I, I, people, I don't know if that's been used other way, other way. Uh, it might've been like an existing thing, but it just kind of caught my eyes. Like a good way to explain this. It's like, you need a retention strategy. You need a nutrition strategy. Mm-hmm. Like what, what position are you going to be if people leave your organization? And I speak with way too many CEOs that are just like, Oh, this person left would be like totally fucked. And it's like, well, like, what, what, like, what, are, you, okay. what are you, what are you doing about that? Like, you what you, yeah, and exactly. it's like retention. I have to figure out how this person is going to be married to me forever. And we're going to die together. It's like, <laughs> dude, like nobody's yeah. like, that's like, that's sense. your strategy. It's like, I mean, and get it. Like, it, I just think that it's like, and the other thing when it comes to retention, is like, you, you never, and hopefully I think people get this intellectually, like experience leaders, but we still, we we're human beings and, and we develop connections with people and we care about people. And you, you shouldn't, you got to make sure you never fall in the trap of thinking about this concept of like loyalty. And even like, if, for instance, like if I do feel loyal to someone, like I always like, you have to put on the lens of like, it's not about loyalty. It's about alignment of objectives. Like do I understand what this person wants to accomplish? It is a lot. Is it aligned with what the team needs to accomplish? And as a leader, how can you facilitate, um, you know, those objectives, right? Like, like that, and that always has to be like where the emphasis is. So that, that ultimately is your retention strategy is understanding what people want. Is it aligned with what the, where the company needs to go? Mm -hmm. And, uh, And kind of understanding, I think that people should always be in connection with recruiters with uh, having other conversations i think kelly one of our amazing team members did a post yesterday about this topic you should always be having conversations and kind of knowing where you are in the market having options if you need them i mean even in this volatile time 
I think that's what we've learned, right? That we need to kind of have these options and be open to communicating and to connecting. And that's so important for us as recruiters as well. So I think as a CEO, as hiring managers, understanding that and being very open and communicating openly with your team members, that's kind of the key of success. Yeah. Right. And so for Morella, our producer, tuning in, if you could post um, or, or plug in Kelly's uh, LinkedIn post uh, into the description and then also plug in my post uh, about like retaining talent as point one and then attrition strategy as point two. Um, I think that that's something helpful. And then the, the last thing I'll just say, like tying back to compensation, I know we've kind of shifted beyond that, but um, you know, one of, one of the, like, just one additional point I would make on that is like adapting the the compensation strategy. Like when it comes to offer process of like, if, if this candidate declined my offer, how much would I be willing to increase my offer to persuade the candidate to accept? Um, because I think a lot of times companies do start too low. So I'm not saying outbid the market all the time, but you should start where you're willing to go, you know, understanding where the budget is. Like, hopefully you're not hiring somebody unless you're like a big believer in what they bring to the table. Okay. Um, like start, start with like, if they were to decline, how much would I wish I had paid? And like, that's a conversation too, to have with the CFO. Um, like you, you need to make sure the CFO understands that compensation strategy because they are always going to try to influence it and lower uh, the budget. Like that's their job. So you need to understand what the top end of the budget is. Uh, truly is and and make sure that you're offering people that and the other thing to remind your cfo of is um you know look like we're hiring this person because we believe that they are demonstrating and adding value that if if they are not adding that value you're not committing to that salary on a multi-year basis like you're committing it to it to a reasonable ramp time to see if they're able to meet expectations in the role and if they're not meeting expectations or role and it's mutually not a good fit then it would be time to part ways so you, you got to like, I think that, you know, having that kind of conversation now, hopefully like your hiring process is on point enough to where that, that doesn't happen often. You can never bat it, you know, it, it's never going to be a hundred percent, but you can get pretty good at it. Um, I, I just think that that's just like time, time back to that aspect. And, and maybe Marilla will actually like copy and paste what I just said, like to earlier in the conversation that maybe it might make more sense, but anyways, just another side thought I had. Yeah. And I think that's part of our expertise as recruiters is that we have those conversations starting with our first conversation where we're like yeah. both with our candidates and with the clients that we're hiring for, Hey, honest talk time. Like we find the perfect candidate. What are you willing to pay them? And then to the candidate, Hey, honest talk time. What do you want? Like what would make you make a move? So I think just opening it up and letting everyone be candid and not having comp be this like cagey, scary thing that you can't discuss from day one of your conversation allows you to have that much better experience when you get to offer where you are actually both aligned. The company's happy with the decision. The candidate's happy with the decision. Everyone goes home happy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And to further Julia's point, I think one of the things that needs to happen early on is that when a client comes to you and says, this is what our, our range is for this particular role. Well, that may not be what market is. We'll be happy to go ahead and out to market with that price point, but we're also going to do a market survey. And we're going to find out what it's really going to take to get that award-winning top talent. And we're going to come back and present that to you so that you can go in, in advance of an offer phase. You've already gone back to finance and said, hey, we're seeing candidates are coming in between this range and this range. We need to up our offering. Right. I, I like that's where it's like it's better to hire fewer people at a, a higher salary than more people at a lower. So it's like if you need to hire five people for a team, like, but you are paying like median salaries or below market. Why don't you hire two and get them to where they need to be and, and right size people that are already on the team? It's like, well, then we don't have the bandwidth to do what we need to do. It's like, okay, getting back to having someone similar to Andrea, like what does the process look like? How can you mm -hmm. optimize that leverage technology? Why isn't like, what about prioritization, right? Like, can you prioritize what's happening in that department so you can make it work? And if none of those things are the case, like if you have too much work to prioritize based on the budget, then that becomes a CFO conversation. But the the the, the goal should never be like to try to hire people at a discount rate. Like that, there's, it's indicative of other problems. Either your budget isn't big enough, your process is not uh, good enough, your prioritization isn't strong enough, or there's some kind of disconnect at an executive level on what priorities should be and how budget should be allocated as a result of that. Yeah process 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 like that just like whether we're talking about like 
hiring, whether we're talking about uh, retention, attrition strategies, budgets, everything to me comes down to understanding how the machine operates and having the right process and technology to optimize that machine. Like, you know what I mean? Like you got to, you got to build the car the right way so you can put, plug the driver in and expect them to win. Right. And in this case, the car is fluid. I mean, it changes. You need to change. Yeah, it's it. You need to accept that. <laughs> and because once you nail down a process, like it's not going to be your process for the rest of your life. No, you have to revisit it. No. Always kind of that's, be in, in flux with it. That's Andrea's hell. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's like the, we get something done. And then three months later, it's like, hey, can you build this whole new fucking, well, not three months, but like, you know what I mean? Like this. It's hell and optimize it for us. Right. I mean, it's a combination between hell and heaven. That's why I like it at the right. same time. So. <laughs> it's a combination. combination of hell and heaven. That is, that is the, perfect, not the moment. That is like if if someone were to start like a RevOps company, that's a great tagline. Yep. It's, it's like, a combination it's, of heaven and hell. <laughs> yeah, a little hard to pitch. I don't know how well that would go for yeah. you. <laughs> like we'll, we'll take out, we'll do the hell part so you could have the heaven part. Like that's the- that's Yeah, the, I like uh, that. Yeah. That is good. Right, it's like I, I market. Have, I'll take that. <laughs> so, so like, let's just touch on, on, on buzzwords that we're hearing on the market real fast and talent acquisition. Um, I, Andrea, can you kick us off there? Like, what are some of the latest things that we're seeing on LinkedIn? Uh, you know, when it comes to, I feel like talent acquisition always has some new fucking buzzword or like LinkedIn is pushing some new thing. Like what, what are we seeing out there? And what do we think about it? That's the thing. So I was going to propose, we kind of talk about it from a general standpoint of these buzzwords that keep showing up different ones. Like it seems once a month, once every two weeks, there's a new one. Like it doesn't even make sense to start defining all of them or the most recent one. But in a way, I believe that these are just things that have existed in workplace dynamics all the time. I'll give just one example. It's one of the newer ones, it's called career cushioning. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Wait, it. Wait, can you say career what? Cushioning. Career cushioning. cushioning. Yes. <laughs> so it basically means that you as a person who are employed are looking at other job offers at plan B. So exactly what we were talking about. Well, you earlier. just recommended. Yeah. The thing everyone right. should always be doing. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's insane. So one thing is it's already existed for quite some time and then yes, people should actually do it. So I think it's really important for us in talent acquisition to really be careful about which of these terms we actually choose to propagate, right? And to give weight to. Like, I don't feel like we should give weight to many of these trends. I feel like it's, again, in a way, trying to take back power to the side of the employer. Like, hey, they're rage quitting, they're rage applying, they're doing all this stuff. Not really. It's just I don't. I don't know. Like, do you think it's? A, I don't think employers. I don't think any CEOs sitting in a board like meeting like, hmm, like what? what I hope. Where do they come from? No, this is. It's, it comes from LinkedIn. It comes from like BuzzFeed. The random bullshit. influencer. Like, what's the rage applying? Isn't that like one of them? The rage yeah. applying thing actually began as a meme. If you want on TikTok, like people were just memeing on it we're making fun of it and we're saying oh my employer really annoyed me today i'm just gonna go on indeed and rage apply so it was a joke i mean it started as a joke and then it was taken very seriously and it's like that's normal if someone wants to quit their job and apply someplace else of course they're gonna apply in many other areas right if, if they have like a frustrated job. employee that's when i don't you're know gonna go apply that's the yeah. time exactly. adam grant has everybody here heard about adam grant Mm -hmm. Right. Like behavioral yeah. psychologist, organizational psychologist, I suppose. Um, I think he's a professor. He does like all the TED talks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, like one of the things that he said, I was reading like a, a Wall Street Journal article and he was like, this whole thing about quiet, quiet quitting is is ridiculous. Like it used to be called uh, calling it in and then or phoning it in. Sorry. Phoning it in. And then like before that, it was called like mailing it in. Like we've always had a term for this. It's not this like new phenomena. Uh, so I, anyways, like I, I think with a lot of these things, they're just kind of buzzy words. I don't think that they're actually reflective of trends. Mm -hmm. They're just like, they're just kind of clickbait that we see on, on LinkedIn, but I don't think anybody should be actually leveraging it as um, insight to like drive talent strategy. Like don't, don't <laughs> like, and that's the thing, like talent acquisition leaders are going to do that, but your hiring managers definitely are. <laughs> yeah. They're like, There's the whole quiet hiring. That's a confidential search. I've been doing that for years. <laughs> Yes, that was another uh, one. 
It's the worst. I mean, come on, it's a confidential search. It's the worst. <laughs> yeah, it just yeah. sounds better. But yeah, but that's kind of the summary I would say on buzzwords. And I don't want to take away from one thing that I believe is important. Okay, let's ignore the buzzwords, but still let's focus on the workplace dynamics. Like we should still, as employers, as companies, strive to improve our workplace, to yeah. improve, I don't know, expectation setting, having clear expectations, and so on. So it doesn't mean we shouldn't focus on those things. Yeah. Sure. Like, I think we can be dismissive of, like, the dumbness of the language itself while not dismissing what are the circumstances that made you want to rage apply? What are the mm -hmm. circumstances that made you feel like you had to quietly quit and not just be like, hey, my work day is done for today. Goodbye. Right. Like, you're allowed to stop working. Like, you know, Yeah, you and, and also, like, to be fair, like, if an executive comes to me and said, like, I don't know what to do about all this quiet quitting, and my response would be, like, why don't you have transparency surrounding performance in your company? Like, how do you, how do you not know if people are adding value? Correct. Like that, yeah. like be better at your job. <laughs> like, One you know, like as an executive, like your job is to effectively operate, like, and produce an outcome. And you should be aware of how success is measured in your department. Mm -hmm. Like, and if success is being measured in a, a transparent way, if clear expectations are being set, um, that doesn't happen. Like if there's a, a level of disengage, like this idea of like focusing on disengagement is like, it's so subjective. Like what is the outcome the person's producing? I don't care if somebody seems like, I, I don't like that's personality stuff. That's fluff. Like just because somebody isn't like charismatic or like super like, you know, like what is the, like, it, it, what is the outcome they're producing? And if they're, they're either doing the job or they're not, and, and that should be very clear. And so this concept of quiet quitting just cannot exist in a well-run organization. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. And you talked about this engagement and Gallup actually came out with a study recently, which shows that engagement in companies is pretty much the same as it was in these last few years. So it dropped from 36% to 34% in 2021. And there's data again in Gallup showing that, for example, between 2000 and 2013, that percentage was 32%. So nothing major has changed on this front. Of course, we had the pandemic, we had the acceleration of remote work. A lot of things have happened, but it's not like this dramatic thing, like employees are more disengaged than ever. Not really. It's just a matter of, again, being focused as companies, as executives on exactly what people need. How can we improve things for them? And that's about it. Right. Yeah. Well, look, yeah, we covered a lot of a lot of good things today. I love these segments; these are my favorite. Uh, I know everybody tuning in is going to love it. So um, we will we will uh, see you next time next month. We'll do it again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right. Bye. So for everybody tuning in, just a quick remember: every Tuesday morning at five a.m., we publish an episode. So make sure to catch us next week. All of season two is fantastic. By the way, we made a lot of changes to the show. So if you're going back, um, you know, make sure to to check out other episodes in season two. Beyond that, if if you know of anybody that would be a good fit for the show, please let us know whether it's you or somebody that you know. We're taking on you know VPs of talent acquisition, chief people officers, CEOs of talent related products. So uh, if you are listening to this and you're interested, but you've never been on a podcast before, make sure that doesn't stop you. Like the way that we host the show, like within two minutes of recording, you're going to forget you're on a freaking podcast. It's just going to be us talking, having fun. Uh, and and talking about the stuff we know inside and out, so it's it's a uh, it's a it's a real blast, and and you'll walk away with some really high quality content. So if you're interested, make sure to reach out on talenttrends.io, talenttrends.io. And the last thing I'll say is, if anybody tuning in uh, knows anybody that's an expert when it comes to recruiting technology and technology advancements within talent acquisition over the past year, I'm really interested in doing an in depth uh, episode when it comes to recruiting tech and how that's evolving. So please let us know there. And, and that's it. That's all I got to say. So thank you so much for joining us and we will talk to you next week. Take care.